Thank you for coming. Um, well, I am a, a historian of religions. My field of research lies within comparative religion. And it spills over to a sociology of religion, but basically I'm working on comparative religion. And uh, my special field of research, uh, hello? My special field of research has for the past 25 years been what is usually called new religions or new religious movements. And apart from that, I do a lot of other things. I do field work in the rainforest in Borneo, and uh, this is becoming my new field. I've worked with hunters and gatherers for the past six or seven years, but uh, my, my uh, traditional target area is the new religions. And there was a very good reason why I started to study new religions 25 years ago as, as a young scholar. Um, nobody had done it. There were a few sociologists of religion that had taken up the subject, but there were no historians of religions, nobody working in the field of comparative religion who worked on new religions. And they were all around. It's a long time ago, of course, and the world has changed very much since then. And uh, you're, most of you will not remember these things due to your age, of course. And things were quite different, whether it was in, in Western or Eastern Europe in those days, of course. Now it's more floating together, but there were differences. And in Western Europe, there were so many sects and small religious groups and various religious movements creeping and crawling everywhere. There was a kind of boom of new religions. So everybody would talk about it. It was a kind of a thing you would read about it in the newspapers and you would have all the horrific stories of how new religions brainwash, take away children, steal people's money, are subversive in society and destruct family values and all these things. This was 25 years ago. And as a young, a young scholar, I decided that this was a subject to study. This was some, something for me to study. Because there were no books, there were no articles. Nobody had really looked into it, at least not in my country. So I started doing fieldwork the hard way, collecting whatever material there was. And I built my knowledge gradually. And a few more scholars joined and we were a small group, and uh, very soon it became clear to us that what was said by journalists or people from the church was simply not true. We could not identify brainwashing. We could not identify child molesting. We could not identify money being stolen. And there was a debate, of course, and we started to put out books and articles and research became international, and during the next, say, 10 years, it became a new established subject within not only sociology of religions, but also history of religion and compared to religion. And I had a job for that reason. There was something for me to do. Um, there's a lot to say about new religions, and I'm going to say a few things now. Um, but at a certain point, I came to realize that it was totally stupid not to work as a historian and go back in time and for comparative reasons study the new religions of the past. There were many new religions in the past, but they're not new any longer because time has gone and suddenly they are old. So it would be like early Islam, early Sikhism, early Buddhism, I don't know how many different kinds of Hinduism, early Christianity, of course, and so on and so forth. And the obvious thing to do was, of course, to see if there was a pattern in the historical material compared to the material of the present that would allow us not only to speak about this new religion, and this new religion, and this new religion, but speak about new religions as a category, as a type, as a phenomenon, so to say. So I started to work on a comparative basis by studying 
ancient new religions as well, mainly from the Hellenistic Roman period, which means from 200 before until 200 after, the way we count time, the beginning of our time count. And this was easy, really, because this is exactly what historians and historians of religions have been doing for a very long time. Early Buddhism, early Christianity, early Islam. This is what my colleagues did already. So without really realizing it, a lot of historians were studying new religions. But new religions in the past. The Hellenistic Roman mystery cults, various brands of Gnosticism, different kinds of Christianities, and so on and so forth. And if we went further out into the world, further abroad, there would be a host of new religions to go into in the past. So what I'm proposing today is an interpretation of New Testament texts as sources to a new religion, to a sect, to a cult, to a strange movement that nobody liked, that everybody feared, a sect that people would call stupid, dangerous, pervert, insane, ridiculous, exactly as people today talk of the new religions of the present. What I propose is that early Christianity was the Scientology of those days. It's the best, it's the best uh, um, uh, comparison that you can come up with. Or the Mormons of those days. Or the Unification Church of those days. Or whatever group that you know of that attracts negative attention, that people fear, that people dislike. We're dealing with the sociological phenomenon here. The relation between larger society on one hand and a deviant, strange, new religious group on the other hand. There's always tension. There's always some kind of, of conflict going on. And that conflict, that social context in which the new religion rises, explains a lot. But it does not necessarily say something about that particular group. It usually says more about the surrounding society. Not only today, but also in ancient times. So, given that most people, for instance in this country, are Christians, most people also used to read the New Testament as the story of how their religion began, of course, but in religious terms, how God came to humans, how he did things in the shape of Jesus, what then happened, how people can be saved, miracles and blah, 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 all these things. And of course, this is how the text works in a religious context. But to the historian, it's an entirely different story. It's a source that shows what people came to believe, why they came to believe it, what kind of mythology they developed, why the rituals came out the way they did. It's a source to social reality, not to anything spiritual, religious, metaphysical. I leave that to the church. It's not my business. To me, it's a human-made text reflecting human-made incidents in a way that includes fantasy, mythology, and not least strategy. Because what a new religion wants to is to position itself in a way that makes it attractive. And in the earliest sources that tell about the inception of Christianity, we see very clearly how people try to find their way to make their religion attractive. And we can, in the New Testament texts, also see how they were in conflict with the surrounding society, what people accused them for, how they had to defend themselves. So the text, if we read it in that way, refers to social reality, not metaphysical ideas, notions, suggestions. Um, this can be done in many ways, but what I've tried to do is to sketch 
a list of themes that are relevant when we talk about new religions. And I'll try to show you that they apply today in exactly the same way as they applied a very long time ago. And Milda is turning off the... the so. Okay. But I'll say a few words about new religions before I, I, I go to this specific theme. When we talk of new religions, we usually think of it as something special. Well, there's a new religion. Huh? And there's another one here. Huh? Well, suddenly there are a few of them here. Strange. Well, it wasn't there two years ago. Now it's there. Well, we shouldn't be surprised. The history of religions throughout the history of mankind is a history of new religions, of religious innovations, of religions coming and going. This is the normal. This is the standard. Thousands and thousands and thousands of religions have come and gone without anyone taking it down. So we don't know about them. Nobody wrote about it. There were no sources. They just disappeared again. And many, many, many religions exist even now today. I'm sure also in this country that nobody knows of. Not even Milda, who works professionally to, to see, see to it that, that we know about it. There will be some that she doesn't know. Um, the history of religions is a history of change. Nothing stands still. Everything changes and it changes no matter what you do. So, even the new religions that manage to survive because most of them disappear again, they come and go, pop, and then they die. Pop, another one, and then it dies. Pop, another one, and then it dies. But even the few that have remained alive and become big are totally different today compared to what they were when they started. So they are reinventing themselves every morning when the sun rises. Like I'm not the same person I was 53 years ago when I was born. I was a very cute little baby. I'm not any longer. I'm a rather rude grown-up man. So in a way, it's still me. It's the same genes, so to say. But they are present in the world in a very, very different way. There hasn't been one year or one minute in my life where I have been the same. And the same goes for any religion. Beliefs change, rituals change, aesthetics change, social structures change, perceptions of history change, everything changes. So claiming that modern Catholicism is the same as one of the Jesus movements 2,000 years ago is ridiculous. There's a historical connection between the two, of course, but the changes are far more at work than that which has continued. Which is why it is a completely different thing. It's a new religion. In the sense that it changes all the time. Catholicism is a new religion every day. Imagine what is happening right now, the new pope he is so fundamentally different from the previous. So, there are, of course, social structures, political structures, economic structures that keep the Vatican going, as always, so to say. But nevertheless, new ideologies are present, new things are said, it's done in new ways, and the Vatican is slightly changed actually more than most people would ever dream of in such a short time. And it may have an impact on the way ordinary Catholics throughout the world will think and act in a nearer future. And it will be a new religion. Or at least the religion will have changed into something it wasn't a short time before. So the question is, when is a religion a new religion? And when, it is, when is it a an old religion that has changed into something else? I think it's difficult to answer. So my take on this is that religion is always a dynamic phenomenon, a changing phenomenon, just like language, for instance. 
If you listen to a movie made 50 years ago, you will recognize this as Lithuanian, but they speak in a different way. There are words they don't use because they were not invented. They don't say mobile phone, they don't say internet. Of course not. And you can hear the sound of the language is different if you compare it to the way you speak yourself. And there will be words that they use in the old movie that you, you don't use today because they are no use any longer. Because that particular word doesn't give any meaning. It refers to something that doesn't exist any longer. Exactly the same with religion. Belief systems are changing. Beliefs come, beliefs go. If you take the Nikean creed, like we in this church believe, blah, 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 blah. This is the formal, the official. But I'm sure that it will be very difficult to find a person who says, yes, I accept all of this on an equal scale. No, people will say, yes, this and that and that. I really do believe in that. But this and that, ah, probably not. And it changes all the time. People are different. It's a dynamic phenomenon as any other human cultural phenomenon. It's a good thing to understand uh, religion as a language. Because languages change and so do religions. So what I propose is that we think of the history of religion as the history of new religions. This is, the change is what, is what is going on. Change is the real thing. In the same way as we change throughout our lives, so are religions a changing phenomenon. Which is why we can't talk of Islam. It's ridiculous. Buddhism, it's ridiculous. Christianity, it's ridiculous because what does it refer to? It refers to processes. It refers to differences. You know, if we talk about Christianity, there are, of course, the Catholic Church, Protestantism, Anglicanism, Orthodox Christianity. But within those, there are, I don't know how many different branches, how many different sects, how many different denominations. And sociologists of religion and the International Council of Churches. You're welcome. Do you want to come in? Okay, so uh, don't, it's okay. Fascinating. Um, well, the number of different denominations, Christian de denominations and churches in the world is roughly 40,000. 40,000 different churches exist in the world today and all of them will claim that they are the right one and the others are crazy. There's only one who's not a member of, of the, the, the big church organization. That's the Catholic Church. They don't want to be a member because they claim that they are the right one and they don't want to be associated with the rest. As far as I know, it could have changed. I don't think so. Anyway, this makes it obvious that there is no such thing as Christianity. There are Christianities. And they can fight among themselves which one is the best. I'm not going to judge. Uh, but it also shows that religions are best understood not as abstract phenomena such as Islam or Buddhism or Christianity. It's far better to talk about people, religious people, and say Christianity, what it refers to, is in fact Christian people. That is, people who produce Christianity. People who do the things, think the things, and say the things that make up this cultural phenomenon that we call, in this case, Christianity. And Islam, well, it's an abstract thing, forget about it. No, the, the interesting thing is Muslims, because Muslims are people who create Islam. The makers of Islam, the producers of Islam. Everything that has to do with Islam is made by these people. So, rather than talking of religions, we should talk of religious people. And in terms of new religions, we see that they appear when a group of people, for one or another reason, decide that what, what exists is not good enough. Something else is better, namely what we have, what we contribute, what we offer the world right now. Which is why, of course, these people very often find themselves in a position 
where they say we are the best, we are the elite, the only reason why we are here is that the rest is rubbish, otherwise we wouldn't be here. If, the, if it was good enough, that which already prevails, so why make up something new? No, they're only there because they don't like what is already there. So this elitist group identification is so typical to new religions, and this is exactly where we depart uh, when we talk about uh, ancient Christianity as a new religious movement. The overall ambition with this uh, would be to create a stronger historical dimension in the study of new religions. Another ambition would be to improve the basis for a diachronic, crisscrossing time comparative study of new religions. And of course, this would consolidate the study of new religions as a subject that we have to deal with at the university. Uh, and that is good in its own right. And of course, this will also add to our understanding of the New Testament, because it will be contextualized in relation to other new religions, and not only itself, as it's usually done. Very often the New Testament is studied out of context, as if it was its own context, which is, which is uh, quite ridiculous. So you could take so many different parts of the New Testament, and of course there are sources from ancient Christianity that you could use as well. But I've limited myself to, to material from the Gospels. But uh, uh, the Acts of the Apostles, the Didache, not least, are two very important texts that also should be taken into consideration. So, new religions are normal. New religions are, new religions are to be expected. And the history of religions is primarily the history of cultural and social change and innovation. So, as I said before, societal conflicts is one of the most obvious themes in a sociological perspective when you talk of uh, new religions. Always trouble, somehow. And um, what we see is usually that members of new religions create a social situation, not always, but usually, where they become socially marginalized. They're not in center of society, they go to the edge of society. They will very often oppose social structures and social conventions, live in other ways, express other societal norms, and they will therefore be in confrontation with the dominant religious powers of society. And they will very often be in confrontation with the political power of society. Sometimes they express hostility to the economic structure of society. And very often there's conflict towards the legal system. We also see that they compete with other groups that are more or less similar to themselves. And we see that within the group, there will be very often power struggle, internal conflicts. And all this, which we can see in all the new religions today, very easily, is also visible in the New Testament texts. The, the first Christians were in the same position. I have for you, if you're interested, a list with all the, the, the references to the biblical texts that underpin what I'm saying. But I only have like three quarters of an hour, so I can't go into that. So you, you will uh, bring home uh, this sheet of paper and you can check out all the references and see the examples of this or that. I'll mention a few things, but, but um, for instance, the social position as more or less marginalized. The New Testament is one long narrative of people that feel that they do not belong to society. They don't even feel that they belong to the world. They are promised that they are not of this world, that everything they know will end and that they will live in another realm very soon. So it's not very strange that they consider the present and the world that they live in 
of less importance than those, the majority, to whom this is the real thing. In the Jewish community of the Hellenistic Roman age, there was the temple in Jerusalem, the temple where all the offerings took place, the cult center where everything was, was sort of focused. And living close to the temple, being able to offer to the, to the big God, uh, well, this is what it was all about. This is how you realized all your religious ambitions. So having this strange position that the Christians came up with was utterly deviant and un unacceptable uh, uh, to, to ordinary people, which is why they became socially marginalized, partly because they were pushed aside, partly, partly because they moved aside. And thereby, of course, it overlaps, I realize that, they were opposing the social structures of society. They didn't accept the kind of power that was prevailing. They maintained that another power was more important. What they would call their, with, with religious arguments, that now their God had intervened, somehow. And uh, in concrete terms, we see how they were in conflict with the legal powers, the political powers, and uh, well, we know how, how, how it ended. Their leader was killed. He was executed after a trial where society decided that this guy is too much and his followers are full of crap. We are not going to buy into this. We are, we are stopping the story right here. At least that's what they attempted. In this modern age, you don't kill people for being deviant in terms of religion. Well, sometimes you do, but not normally. But you may oppose them in other ways and try to prevent them from doing what they want. And throughout Europe now, and not least in Russia, and we have seen attempts in other Eastern European countries as well, and in, in Europe, Italy, France, Greece, Belgium, Germany, there have been so many legal cases where, where people from a, 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 with legal measures have tried to stop new religions. And there are many examples of uh, gurus, uh, uh, mahatmas, masters, uh, um, prophets, uh, reappeared Christs, what have you, who have been forbidden access to either this country or another country. Can't go here. We don't want you here with legal measures. So it's another way of, of, of trying to, to get rid of, of, of these groups. And in some cases, groups have been literally forbidden and abolished. People have, people have been taken to prison if they were in, in this or, or that group. And there's a legal fight all the time. Uh, so the structure is the same. The principle is the same. And on rare occasion, we see how authorities have actually killed religious leaders, where it was absolutely not necessary, but where they chose a very violent path. Nevertheless, most uh, obviously the Branch Davidian case uh, from, was it 1993 or something like that. Um, so what characteristic features are there uh, when we talk about the belief system of new religions? Well, it appears that they have all the same beliefs as older religions, to use that term but it's emphasized in another way. It's handled in another way. Usually they will insist that they are, uh, well, they, they seek legitimation uh, through tradition. They claim tradition. The early Christians understood themselves as the real Jews and looked at the host of Jews and, and, and said, you're wrong Jews, because you don't realize that Messiah, the Messiah has arrived. So you, you simply don't see your own tradition. You don't see the realization of what you have hoped for. Now he's here and you're still waiting. Crazy guys, come on, he's here. And the Jews looked at him and said, well, he's not good enough for us. He's baloney, it's crap. We don't consider him the real Messiah, forget about it. This is a very good example of how a fight over tradition takes place, and it still happens, because a number of reappeared Christs exist in the world today. I showed you a few photos of them earlier today. They have a very 
small following. But what they claim is that, well, in the Bible it says that Jesus will come back. And here he is. This is Jesus who came back, exactly as promised in the sacred book. And we are very sorry that you don't believe it. So they are repeating exactly the same structure as we find in the old text, where the Jews refuse to accept Jesus as their Messiah. It's exactly the same structure, going on and on, using tradition for ideological and strategic purposes. New religions also uh, reinterpret and change, alter already prevailing religious beliefs. They rarely come up with something entirely new. What they do is usually that they take what is already there and they reshape it slightly, change it a bit, make it into their own version, add a little of this, add a little of that, but always build on what is already there. The reshaping of Judaism in the New Testament and the whole structure of the early Jesus movements, because there was not only one, there were several, uh, the Jesus movements, they take on the shape of Hellenistic Roman mysteria, mystery cults, uh, with initiations, with secrets, with sacred meals, with all these, uh, the, the whole theology of God's dying and coming to life again is not a Christian invention. It was very widespread in Hellenistic Roman times, and it's quite obvious that the early Christians took that myth and reshaped it into a kind of Jewish narrative where the Messiah would die and become alive again. Uh, prior to Jesus, there are a number of Hellenistic Roman gods that die and come to life again in their myths. So this is probably the direct uh, source of, of inspiration. We have esotericism in varying degrees, religious secrets. Early in the Jesus movement's history, this wasn't just for anyone. You needed to be baptized and you needed to, to join the, 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 well, the, the sacred meal. Oh, what is the word? I've forgotten the word. The Eucharist. To join the Eucharist. Um, in order to get access to the kind of salvation that they, they, they believed in. And it, and it was about revealing secrets. There were things, religious truths, that you could not get to learn unless you had been through these two levels of initiation. Like in all the other esoteric Hellenistic Roman uh, mystery cults where you had to be initiated into sacred knowledge in order to obtain salvation. That changed once Christianity had become not a minority religion, but a majority religion. Then, at that point, secrecy was no longer needed, and it sort of came out. There are still remnants of it, of course, in the rituals and in the Orthodox Church, where, where the priests are keepers of sacred rituals that are not accessible uh, to the, to the uh, uh, members of the con congregation in, in, in general. New religions will always entertain ideas of miracles and there will be a lot of legends of extraordinary things happening right now. When we look in the New Testament and it says that Jesus would walk on water, well, we tend to say, well, it happened a long time ago. In those days it could happen because Jesus was, was Jesus. Well, okay, uh, but to, to people living today, when they talk about their gods, their messiahs, their gurus, their leaders, their religious ideals, they can do the same. They go through walls, they are in two places at the same time, suddenly appear, then they go away again, they go back and forth in their incarnations, they know what you think, they can do all sorts of miracles. And I've talked to, I don't know, perhaps hundreds of people who have told me that they have seen people fly in the air or all these kinds of miracles, exactly in the same way as we can see that people talked about Jesus. And it's very important to understand that these texts were not written 
just as these events were supposed to happen. They are written way later. The earliest text is the letters of Paul. They are written at least a generation after Jesus had died. So, its story is about what happened. It's not eyewitness accounts. These are stories. And in the same way, when people tell about Scientologist founder Ron Hubbard, they say all sorts of things about him that are so fantastic that you, well, if you're a Scientologist, you believe it, but otherwise you won't believe it. The interesting thing is, Hobbit died in 1986. 1986. That's like, how much is that? 25 years ago, 26 years ago, or something like that. And I'm following how the legend of Hobbit is developing. And year by year, he becomes more and more fantastic. More and more miracles are associated with him. And the cult for him, the rituals in his honor, his pictures everywhere, is growing and growing and growing. And suddenly people know things about him that they, they did not know while he was alive. Because nobody said it, nobody talked about it, nobody was interested. Know why? Because the idea had not formed at that point. It is a result of a social process where he is being constructed as a divine human being. Exactly the same is available in the New Testament. You can see how Jesus, bit by bit, is being built as a God, constructed as a God, under direct influence of Hellenistic Roman religious ideology. He is copying so many elements already available in that cultural realm. Typical to new religions is also that they promise a fundamental change of the world. Everything will change. Everything will change. You will be born into a new reality, so to say. Which means that most new religions feel that they exist on the edge of time, right here where everything is ending and something new is beginning. The idea of the kingdom of God arriving in the days of Jesus was their way of expressing this expectation. And it's obvious from the texts that the early Christians believed it to happen in their own days. St. Paul tells his followers you don't have to get children because humanity, as we know it, will stop. You will live in heaven. So sexuality is no good. There's no reason to reproduce. And exactly the same is available as an argument in a number of new religions today where people say, well, this is the end. A new thing will emerge and we are the final generation. We're not supposed to produce children. So they don't. Of course, there's also warnings. If you don't follow us, you will be very sorry because you will be punished by the gods or you will lose your soul or you will not uh, enter eternity or you will incarnate eternally or whatever religious persuasion there is at hand. But this division between us, the saved, and you, the lost, is so obvious and very apparent in the New Testament. And therefore, as I said before, an elitist ideology is always there. We are those who know, you are those who don't know. We, we, we are the good guys, you are the bad guys. This is the structure. When religions grow and become very large, people are more laid back. From a theological point of view, any Christian in, in, in principle will have to say, if you're not Christian, well, you'll not be saved, or you can only hope for salvation or something like that. Uh, because Jesus is the only one who has the ability to save. If you don't believe in him, well, bad for you, or something like that. And then, of course, be good friends nevertheless, play football together, or be colleagues, or even friends, or what have you. But in small sects, there's a more intense feeling of Elitism, 
a more intense feeling of being special and that you have to distance yourself to other people. So isolation is also sometimes a part of the game. And you can see in the New Testament how people are explicitly told to avoid the company of those that don't believe. Don't be with them. Don't talk to them. And then, of course, there are, and I think it's significant, what I would call unrealistic ambitions. These little groups always want to conquer the world. We are 25 persons in this group, recognizing that you are the godmother who will change everything, and we are going to rule the world. Not today, perhaps not tomorrow, but it will happen. In that sense, they very often have these unrealistic ambitions. And, uh, well, as I said before, new religions tend to go away as, as fast as they appear. But if they survive over a long span of time, could be like 50 years or 100 years perhaps, uh, they will usually not grow very big. They will remain very small. They could be outspoken. They could show themselves but they will have very little societal impact. Um, which is why new religions that become really big is the strange phenomenon. We should be much more concerned in sociological terms, trying to answer, why the hell did Islam succeed? Why did Buddhism succeed? Why did Christianity, Christianity succeed? And, and, and live and grow and differentiate in the way they did? That is the real phenomenon if we, are, if we want to, to understand uh, things that are strange, because most of them don't. And if we study the New Testament and early Christianity, we will, of course, find very good reasons why this particular new religion survived. Mind you, this was not the only new religion of those days. In the New Testament, Jesus is quoted for saying, be aware of the false prophets. They come as lambs, but they are wolves. Well, why would he say that? Or why would those who have created what Jesus is supposed to have said, why would they say it? Well, simply because this was the case. There was competition. Many groups, many gurus, in Hindu terms, we would say many prophets in, in a Jewish Christian context, competing. There's a mentioning in the New Testament of the other ones standing down by the square and saying their things. So we can imagine, like we know today, offers from various groups all the time, announcements from various groups, commercials from various groups, mission from different groups. So be aware, and they all say that. We have the real deal, the others have bad copies. So, Christianity survived. Up until the 4th century, the cult of Christ was competing with the cult of Mithras, the, the, the god Mithras, the Hellenistic Roman god Mithras. And then Christianity took off. Why? Well, the obvious uh, explanation is that the Jesus religion related to women, to the poor, to children, as well as to the rich and the powerful. This was a new thing. In social terms, this was definitely a new thing. So, rather than considering Christianity as a belief system which was entirely unseen, no, 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 it was building on things that already was there, but the social structure of the early church was unseen. The idea of bringing in all members of society to this new fellowship created probably an economic structure, a trade structure, a political structure that enabled the group to survive. And furthermore, it did not become big in Palestine where it originated. It became big during the third century in the Hellenistic Roman world outside of Palestine. It wasn't the Jews who accepted it, not at all. They had to travel to entirely different lands to gain some kind of footing. And they were extremely good at making political alliances along the way. But it was a bumpy way because in periods, of course, as you know, the Christians were severely persecuted by the Romans. 
It was prohibited to be a Christian. They were tortured and they were killed and it was awful. But then gradually they entered society in terms of finance, politics, trade and so on. And finally, when the Roman Empire towards the end of the third century came to a halt and came tumbling down, what was to become the Catholic Church moved in and took over the whole administration of the empire. Which is why, by the way, the Pope today is called Pontifex, Pontifex Maximus, Pontifex Maximus, which means the, the, the highest uh, bridge builder. And that is the honorable title for the finest Roman priests in pre-Christian times. So it's a symbol of how the church took over when the Roman system came down. He even has the Roman guy's title. The Pope has the Roman equivalent's title, Pontifex uh, Maximus. There are, well, it's a bit more than three quarters of an hour. I hope it's okay. Um, the fact that new religions very often are, are, are built on, on, on a single person, like uh, what we usually call a charismatic leader, is, uh, is important. It's not always the case, but it's usually the case that an individual, a person, is in center of things. And obviously this is also the case in early Christianity where Jesus is the object of devotion. Mind you, the New Testament relates, of course, what allegedly happened to Jesus. But he was only working as a prophet for like one and a half or two years or something like that. So most of it is actually about, as a historical source, about how people who talked about Jesus were thinking and acting. And we can see that they were so preoccupied with, the, with this individual who they concerned, or who they, they saw as a god, of course. And it mirrors exactly what we see in new religions today. All these gurus and mahatmas and masters and swamis and prophets and reappeared Christs and what have you are considered, one way or another, to be extremely special. And all religious ambitions, ideas, behavior, blah, 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 relate to this specific person. So although religions very often talk about transcendence and God being in another world or the gods or the spirits being in another world or something, in fact, at the end of the day, it's all boiled down and condensed in a person who they focus on. So Jesus as the devotional object here is very typical, very typical. There's one other human in those days who has a cult of the same magnitude, although he doesn't survive, and that's the Roman emperor. He is constructed as a god during the very same period as Jesus develops from a prophet into a god. And when the texts talk about this extraordinary person, he is always of a miraculous or divine origin. He's not just an ordinary person, he has a very special origin as, in the case of Jesus, an incarnation of God, born by a virgin, and so on and so forth. Always miraculous. Um, he's looked upon as divine or as a god, as I just said, and he has divine command. He's in charge. Whatever he says is true. Whatever he claims is true. He can, he, can, he can determine things by saying things. He has a divine mandate. And he's usually in contact with other divine beings. He's usually not alone. He may be the strongest, the one on top of things, but like in the case of Jesus, there will be demons. He's casting out demons. Satan, he is fighting Satan. He will meet Antichrist. There are angels. There's the Holy Spirit. There's his semi-divine mother. And of course, there's God the Father. So there's a host of other creatures, other, other 
beings that are unhuman and more or less divine or demonic or whatever they are. And the same today, religious leaders are usually in contact with other types of beings. So they claim universal power and not irrelevant religious leaders today, as in those days, will very often use a kind of secretive or coded language that is hardly understandable unless you are part of the group. Not that they use strange words, well, they sometimes do, but they will say things that is only kind of understandable if you know their teachings, if you know uh, what it's all about, if you're part of the movement. Like when, when, um, when it is said in, in the New Testament, uh, how, how, how does it go? Like, um, those who have ears hear. Meaning, if you don't have the right kind of ears, you don't hear this. And those with the right kind of ears are those who are a part of our group, which has to do with esotericism, of course, as I said before. The religious leader will perform miracles, very often exorcisms. On almost every page in the New Testament, Jesus is driving out demons. He's primarily an exorcist. That's his, his primary job or primary uh, function. And they express what in so psychological terms probably would be like megalomania, that they have this enormous importance and enormous ability and enormous consequence for the world that nobody can match. Like, uh, like uh, it's, how do you translate it? I know it in Danish. Uh, um, I am the road, the truth and life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. It's like saying that I'm the only one. Forget about the rest. I am the only one. Sun Myung Moon says the same. Father Divine says the same. Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh said the same. Bhaktivedanta Swabhuprat said the same. Ron Hobbit says the same. And so on and so forth. And the way they are built in social context emphasizes just that. When Jesus sends them out, uh, he, he dies, he becomes alive again, and he sends out his followers to do missionary work, and he says, every human being in the world is supposed to be my disciple. I am in full command. This is my world. And this is so typical. He is not the first to have said it, and he will certainly not be, and he certainly wasn't the last. Religious leaders will discursively, the way they speak, reject wealth. They will reject money. They will, will, they, they will discursively reject uh, uh, an income. That's very typical. Uh, whether the organization that they represent receives an income, that's something completely different. But in terms of, of their discursive appearance, they will reject money. And they will introduce rituals in their own honor. Create rituals that should be used in order to honor them. Sometimes they do it a bit secretly so that it appears as if somebody else has, has, has done it. But there will always, in the context of the new religious movement, be some kind of, of, uh, of, of ritual that relates the members to the leader. And in the New Testament it's very plain. Jesus tells them, do this, eat, drink. When you do it, I'll be there, blah, blah, blah. So the ritual is established in, in, in the text. It's established by the same person who is honored in the ritual. And, 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 and. Of course, as I said before, uh, uh, the charismatic leader has the ability to do things that nobody else can do. Look into the future, know what people are thinking, and so on and so forth. I think I said it uh, before. Now, charisma is not a substance. It's not a quality. It's a relation between the person who is supposed to be very special and the people surrounding him or her who are creating him as or her as very special. So it's a sociological, a social process that creates religious leadership. It's not something you are born with. 
it's built by means of social relations. So Ron Hubbard doesn't, uh, he didn't have special kind of innate qualities, but he was made special in an interaction with those who found what he said interesting and relevant. And so he developed into something very special. The same goes for all the rest. And in the New Testament, you can see how Jesus is created in discursive ways and social ways to be situated as a God in people's minds, in the ritual, and so on and so forth. Which is why it's very re relevant to, to uh, consider the religious leader's relation to his followers. And in the New Testament, you can see that Jesus is constantly surrounded by a very small inner group of supporters. We will find exactly the same in all the new religions of the present. There are very good models, sociological models, that describe different levels where you can be a member of a new religion. And what we see here is the inner group, the nucleus. And we get a feeling of the next level and the next level as well. And well, it wasn't until 1985 when James Beckford published his famous model that all fell into place because nobody really considered that this was it. But on a comparative basis, you can see that this is what is actually expressed in the New Testament texts. You can also see that the leader and his group remains largely isolated from the majority. I talked about that just before. And it's also apparent that he asks for and enjoys this company. He asks for a following. I know of no a religious leader who doesn't ask or invite people to join him and be close to him. Jesus does exactly the same. Forget about your family and follow me. These are your real brothers and sisters, not your family. Follow me if you want to live. This is what he says. He wants a crowd. And of course, he's honored in all possible ways and spoken of as, as very special and people treat him in ways they wouldn't treat other people. And as you can understand from what I'm saying, the religious leader is usually mythologized, turned into a legend, even when alive, but even more when he's dead. The teacher or the leader, sorry, the leader teaches, instructs, imbues, orders, and defines rules of all kinds. He's also managing the social life of the group. And, of course, and not least, he usually demands full commitment and orders missionary work. Now, this may sound negative. It may sound as if I said all these things are bad or something like that. I don't say that. I'm trying to describe social reality in these groups. People don't feel offended by it. They don't feel that it's wrong. These complicated social interactions that takes place, not only between the leader and the group, but also within the group, between members, is a very complicated social thing that is difficult to measure, difficult to show, difficult to explain. But it's happening in the same way as people are building social networks, groups, interest groups, uh, one way or another, in other cultural contexts. So this is just one way of creating society. And when I'm saying that new religions are doing what the old religions always did, I mean that among, for instance, Catholics in this country, Jesus is still created along these lines. People still behave along these lines. People still believe along these lines, but in a different manner, because they are many people. There has elapsed a very long time. The social, cultural, general context is very different, which is why it is not the same. But all the components are there. So what I propose is that new religions are ordinary religions under special social conditions. And the special social conditions has to do, have to do with the fact that they are new in terms of time, 
they are small in terms of membership, they are marginalized in terms of social relations, etc., etc., which means that they function in society in other ways compared to religions that have developed, become big and well-established in society. But they are not less religions. They are religions under certain circumstances, exactly like the Catholic Church in Lithuania is a religion under certain circumstances. It's a majority, it's in full control, it's in power, it's hand in hand with at least some politicians, etc., etc. And it's only, it only appears the way it does in this country because of that political, social, economic structure, situation in which it exists. So take another huge religion, Islam. In this country there are between like two or three thousand Muslims. Their conditions are very different because they are situated in society in another way. So, it's not that some religions are more religions than other religions, but religions are different because they are situated in society under different conditions. What I've meant to show today is simply that if we want to understand the viability, the dynamics of society, we have to understand that new religions is a given thing, not a surprising thing. It's just as normal as if, if, uh, that uh, the change of, of fashion, the change of uh, philosophy, the change of politics, the change of architecture, the change of education, the change of anything. And if we want to understand it thoroughly, we have to put it into a historical context. And one way of doing it is to ponder over ancient texts. And today it was like the New Testament. We could have used the surahs and the Quran if it was Islam. We could have used Tripitaka if it was Buddhism, and we could have used so many other things if it had been uh, other religions. A guy in Egypt that, well, it ex has existed now for 2,000 years, but in 3,000 years it doesn't exist any longer. He would believe you to be crazy. But when G imagine that Jesus, we talk about Jesus, imagine that Jesus was standing and watching the pyramids. And the, a guy come by here, and Jesus would say to the guy, tell me, what are these pyramids? What, what are they? The guy would say, nobody knows. They have always been there. We have no clue as to what they are. And he would go on with his camel or his donkey. Because it had been forgotten already at that time. So if we have to set our minds straight and understand that we we deal with things in our own vision. It's so narrow. When we put on the historical perspective, everything changes. And we see things in a different perspective. And of course, this is not entirely uh, good news uh, if you believe that this is a divine revelation, of course. But to the historian, there's no escape. It would be counter to everything we know about history, about humanity, about society, to claim that these things are just as they are. So in the short run, you should go and ask your grandmother, how was Lithuanian Catholicism when you were a child? And she will tell you something that shows you that it was different from what it is today. And that's, that's the test case. You will never ever come across a situation where religions do not change over time. It does not exist. So even if you have the same text, you have new interpretations. But even the text changes because it's translated in new ways. And there'll be a fight and somebody don't like that word to be there and that word to be there. So there's a war and all those books are burned and only those are used. And then we have a new meaning of the text. It happens all the time. And when I'm saying all the time, I don't mean this Wednesday and next Thursday, but I mean this century and two centuries later, or something like that, which we don't feel, but it's there. Change is there all the time.